So this morning, we are in our third message in our series, Made for More. And over the course of this series, we've been talking about this longing that is within each of us, this desire for something more. Whether you're a young adult who's looking down on the horizon and wondering, is this all there is? Or if you're someone who is a seasoned adult and you get to the end of your life and you're wondering, have I done all that I could? You know, those questions sometimes nag at us and, and continue to persist. You know, we often feel like we can satisfy that longing through different things. At least in the world, there's so many different opportunities or solutions or answers that the world tries to provide to, to bring that satisfaction that says, I found it, I, this must be it. And uh, sometimes it's the pursuit of power. Sometimes it's the pursuit of prestige or possessions. But in the end, those things all leave us wanting and wanting still more because indeed we're made for more than power we're made for more than prestige we're made for more than possessions and so where do we find the satisfaction for which we long last week we talked about this idea of training for more and we looked at the the the, the idea of training to become disciples who make disciples living a, a life of multiplication and so the whole purpose in all of that, Paul gave us an illustration of three analogies, really. One of a soldier, one of an athlete, and one of a farmer. And we observed that, like a soldier, there needs to be this singular focus. In, and in the end, what we find is God's good pleasure. We also saw in the athlete, there needs to be faithful obedience that results in a crown. Or like the farmer who works hard, there's a share in the harvest. And all of that comes as we give our lives to God. And there we find more. We find a crown. We find a harvest. We find the, the God's good pleasure. So this morning we're talking about the promise of more. And I'm not talking about false promises, like when you go to the used car dealership and he promises to give you two you know, uh, floor mats if you buy the car. We're not talking about those, those empty promises that sometimes the world holds out to us, like this carrot that is dangled before us in pursuit of this longing, but authentic promises, guarantees really, that we have. And, and we're going to read about these in 2 Chronicles 34. If you have your Bibles, yes, that's 2 Chronicles, not 2 Corinthians in the Old Testament. If you don't have your own Bible, there's Bibles in the pew in front of you. It's on page 456 in the pew Bible, 456. So 2 Chronicles chapter 34. And it begins there in verse 1, it says, Josiah was eight years old when he became king. Now, I'm just curious. If you are eight years old, raise your hand. I know we got some eight-year-olds in here. Come on, Libby. We got some eight-year-olds in here. Peter, you're eight. You afraid to come up here? Or are you brave enough to come up here? He's a little, he's a little shy. I have a, can you imagine? Do you, I don't know where this show was, and, and I don't know if it really exists, because I've tried to find it, but in my memory, I remember it was like on Zoom. Do you remember Zoom? is like a Sesame Street show, education show for little kids. It was either Zoom or Electric Company, and I don't remember which one it was, but there was a bit in there about if kids ruled the world. Does anybody else remember that, or am I just making it up? But there was this, there was this bit in there... If kids ruled the world, you know, take your bulletins in there on the back of it. There's a place for sermon notes, right? Fill out that blank. If kids ruled the world, finish the, finish the sentence. Take just a minute. Go ahead. Write it down. If kids ruled the world, what? Peter, if kids ruled the world, what would you do differently? Libby, how about you? I saw a hand back here. Who was eight back here? If kids ruled the world, you know, broccoli would be banned from the dinner table. <laughs> or if Rory ruled the world, apparently, because he, yes. You know, if kids ruled the world, every staircase would have a slide to go down. 
What are some things, if you could imagine, if kids ruled the world? Is that a scary prospect? No. <laughs> Not at all. Josiah is the king at eight years old. And I think that should blow your mind just a little bit, this whole idea of this eight-year-old kid being the king. And it doesn't really tell us anything about how he ruled or if there were court officials that helped him make decisions, if he had some sort of cabinet. It doesn't really tell us any of those things. We can guess that that's true and assume that some of those things are true. But at eight years, eight years old, he becomes a king. And uh, as we go on, you know, sometimes it'd be easy for us to be in this place of, thinking, wow, that's cool. I wish I could have been king when I was eight years old. And we look at other people sometimes and say, man, I wish I could. If only I could. But as you look at it, sadly, it's a tragic tale of how Josiah became king. His grandfather, Manasseh, maybe some of you have heard of Manasseh, and you know this story. He was, his reputation, his legacy was he was an evil king. He had the longest rule in Judah. It was 55 years long. And in the first portion of it, of his rule, it says that he worshipped idols. He worshipped starry hosts, which I suppose is akin to astrology. You know, the moon is in the seventh house and Jupiter aligns with Mars and peace is... I just offended all the hippies in the room because they know that song. But this whole idea of astrology is really the worship of starry hosts. When you're finding your guide to life from the stars. But that's what Manasseh did. He erected in the temple of God these star maps and these idol worship, the, the, the Asherah pole, and these altars to false gods. And he practiced divination. And it says that he sacrificed his sons in the fire. His son in the fire. Uh, you know, it takes a real extreme person to sacrifice his own child. And in the 23rd year of his reign, Manasseh was taken into captivity. God's judgment came upon him. He was taken into captivity. He was taken into captivity by the Assyrians who took him to Babylon. It says, they put a hook in his nose. That's actually where nose piercings began. Okay, it probably started sooner than that. But what's the purpose of it? To take him into captivity in this instance. And they let him out. And for 12 years he was in captivity. But while he was there, God got a hold of him. And Manasseh repented of his sins. He turned back to God because, because of God's judgment taking him into captivity. He relented and he returned to God. And God brought him back to rule some more. Now, he began to, to implement some reform. But sadly... His reputation remained this. He did evil in the sight of God. In the 23rd year, he's in captivity. For the last 20 years of his reigns, he's trying to reform the nation. And then he dies, and his son Ammon takes the throne. And I've got to wonder what's going through Ammon. Am takes the throne at the age of 22, and as I did my math, that means that he was probably born during the, well, not probably, but unless my math is on, wrong, he was born during the time of, his, of Manasseh's captivity. And so most of Ammon's life was seen in Manasseh's response of repentance to God and pursuing God. But still, he followed his father's sin is what's described of him. It doesn't say he followed his father in repentance, only in his sin. His father repented, Ammon didn't. And it makes me stop and wonder, why in the world could someone continue in a father's sins? And maybe, I don't know if this is true, but is it because Ammon actually gave credit to these idols for the fact that he was king? Because if... His brother had not been sacrificed. The brother would have been king. But this 
son that was sacrificed to idols now made room for him to rise to power. Possibly. Speculation. In Ammon's life, his rule was two years, at which point the court officials assassinated him. And after that, it says that the people gathered and they killed the assassins and put Josiah on the throne at eight years old. A grandfather who is known to be an evil king, a father who was assassinated by his court officials who followed in the grandfather's trajectory. And now he's king. You know, sometimes we look at people and we say, man, I wish I had his life. And we could look at this boy king and say, man, I wish I, I wish I had that power and prestige. But we don't always see the background story, do we? The heartache the train wreck of a life that might have led to that position. And the truth is, is that sometimes there's these hidden stories that are there. And, and, and I don't know about you, but I know I would not want to live a life known as one who did evil in the sight of the Lord or one who lost or sacrificed my own children so that this person could gain or someone who was assassinated so that I could rise to this position or power or someone who would, would reject the gospel for the sake of my own kid's success. But people in the world do that all the time. They see the promises of the world that's held out to them and say, I'm going to reject God. I'm going to reject the gospel so that we can have success. But it's this earthly success, this temporal success. It might be the power or the prestige or the possessions. But in the end, are you really wanting to sacrifice your life for the sake of those things? Now jump ahead six years, or eight years. Josiah is now 16 years old. In verse 3, it says, In the eighth year of his reign, so he becomes king at eight, eight years later, makes him 16 years old. It says that in this eighth year of his reign, that he began to seek the God of his father David. You know, at 16... I guess now he's considered a seasoned leader. He's been a leader now for eight years. Uh, okay, so who are the 16-year-olds in the room? We got any 16-year-olds in the room? I know of at least one. Oh, there's two. We got some 16-year-olds. So now you guys are seasoned leaders. <laughs> and the nation is turning to you. It's interesting that it says... He began to pursue the God of his father David. Notice it doesn't say his father Ammon. He chose which ancestor he was going to emulate, which one he was going to try to pursue. And instead of pursuing the idols of his father or his grandfather, he chose his ancestor David and began to follow him. At 16 years old, you know, it's interesting that 80% of the people who come to faith in Christ, the, the statistic still holds pretty true today, um, though the research is fairly old. It says that 80% of those who come to Christ do so before the age of 18. For whatever reasons, most people, their minds are made up by the time they're 18 years old. That means, I, I remember as a youth pastor, I would be at so many graduation ceremonies and I would be sitting there and as I watch students come across the stage, in my mind what often went through my head is, as that student crossed that stage, the chances of him coming to Christ from that point on was pretty limited. If they didn't know Christ by the time they were 18, the odds of them becoming Christians now just went into the tank. It's important that we minister to youth and to children and to emerging generations for that very reason. And Josiah becomes king at eight, begins to seek God at 16. And then 20 hits. Verse 3 goes on, in his 12th year, when he's 20, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of high places, Asherah poles and idols. He got rid of them. In other words, he was ridding the nation. He was purifying the nation of the places where the idols were worshipped. And I do think there's a pattern that's emerging. 
he accepts Christ, a few years later he begins to serve God. He pursues God, he begins to serve God. And then six years later, at the age of 26, it says in verse 18 that Josiah purifies the land in the temple. He enlists workers to oversee the restoration of the temple. You see, the temple had fallen out of sorts. It had no longer been the center of attention like it had been when it was built. It had been marginalized to the edges of society. No longer did people come to the temple to pursue God because they were pursuing their own idols in their own ways. And how easy it is to look at our culture and see how the church has been pushed to the outside. But Josiah sought to reestablish the temple as the center of life. You know, it's interesting when you consider the history of the church and, and the steeples even on the church. The steeples were, to be, were, were erected not because there was some biblical model that said churches had to have steeples, but it was there so that people could find it because it was the center of society and people would look to it. The term parson that you sometimes hear of more in Old English talking about the pastor. He was the parson from what we, which we get parsonage means the person. In colonial America, the pastor, the parson was the most educated, the most prominent person in society. How far we have come from that place. <laughs> the church has been pushed out. As it was here, the temple had fallen into disarray. So at 16, he finds faith. At 20, he begins to serve. And at 26, he begins to pursue holiness. He rids the places of these false altars and idols. He pursues holiness. I think there needs to be that pattern in our lives where you pursue God, you serve God, you cleanse your life of the idols that you've built up within your life. Now, it goes on from there in verse 14. It says, Hilkiah. Hilkiah, which is interesting, turns out that he's the father of Jeremiah. The weeping prophet, you may know him as such, but uh, who would have been prophesying at the same time in the life of Josiah, a little later on in life. But Hilkiah, the father of Jeremiah, finds the book of the law that the Lord had given to Moses. See, it was expected that in the temple that God's law was kept there at the altar. And what had happened to God's word is it had been pushed aside. It had been lost. The temple had fallen in disarray, and God's word had been misplaced. Now think about that for just a minute as you consider Josiah's life. At eight, he becomes king. At 16, he begins to pursue God. It says he pursued the God of his father, David. Where did that knowledge come from? Because God's word had been pushed aside. Who was teaching God's word anymore? It was an oral tradition. It wasn't a written tradition. They weren't coming to God's word because they found God's word. It wasn't where it was supposed to be. It had been pushed aside. But now he begins to pursue God. And as we consider the pattern of his life where he begins to pursue God, where he begins to serve God, where holiness becomes a priority in his life, and now God's word becomes central to everything he does. What was lost is now restored. And it says in verse 19 that when the king heard the words of the law, he tore his robes. That's a sign of repentance, of mourning, to a realization that they had not been living up to the expectations of God. Here is a king who had become king at a young age, but who had begun to pursue God, serve God, to rid his life of the idols. And now God's word confronts him, and he repents. Sometimes we come to church and we think, well, I've, I'm, this is old hat. I've done this for so long. And we fail to allow God's word to convict us and to draw us to a place of repentance. And it doesn't tell us exactly which scroll it is that they found in the temple. We assume, again, it says the book of the law. And we understand that it's not book like we consider a bound book of our 
life in our world today. They didn't have binding companies. It was probably a scroll. We don't know which scroll it is that they found. There's some speculation. Probably Deuteronomy 28 is expected to be one of those. And in that Deuteronomy 28, you read things like this. If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all of his commands... I give you today. This is what this is what will happen. The Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. All these blessings, all those blessings that are recorded in this law and in God's word, all these blessings will come on you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. You will be blessed in the city. You will be blessed in the country. The fruit of your womb will be blessed and the crop of your land, the young of your livestock, the calves of your herds and the lambs of your flocks. Everything's going to be blessed. Everything you touch will be blessed if you keep God's law. But then it goes on in verse 15 of Deuteronomy 28. says, however... If you do not obey the Lord your God and do not carefully follow his commands and decrees I am giving you today, all these curses will be upon you. You will be cursed in the city. You will be cursed in the country. Your basket and your kneading trough will be cursed. Your womb will be cursed. The crops of your land and the calves of your herds and the lambs of your flocks. You will be cursed when you come in and cursed when you go out. See, there's a choice. You obey God's word, you'll be blessed, you reject it, and you will be cursed. And this is likely what Josiah heard. And in that moment, he realized that the nation of Judah had turned their back on God. And because of that, they would be cursed. In fact, it had been promised under Manasseh that they would be delivered into bondage because of their sins. And there was no turning back from that. But because of Josiah and the reading of his word, there was revival that swept through the land. And they turned back to God. Back in 2 Chronicles, in verse, 20, in verse 29, it says, Then the king called together all the elders in Judah, in Judah and Jerusalem. He went up to the temple of the Lord with people of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests and the Levites, all the people, all the people, from the least to the greatest. And he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the law. You know, it's funny how in our culture today that's, in fact, I've shared this with you before. My uncle, we called him Uncle King. That's not his real name, but that's what he taught us to call him at a young age, and uh, is Uncle King. And uh, that says a lot about him. But uh, he's the one that when I told him, you know, I preached 40 minutes, like 40 minutes, right? You remember that story? Well, I saw him again last night at a graduation party, and he was like, well, you got that 40-minute sermon ready? I said, well, yeah. I said, you know, I, only pre I preached last week at my church. It was six and a half minutes. I said, six and a half? You told me it was going to be seven. Well, it got shorter when I got up there, right? So he's telling me all this, and he says, well, how do you preach for 40 minutes? I told him, look, people have asked, how do you know if your sermon's too long? Well, if it's seven minutes and boring, it's too long. But if it's 40 minutes and engaging, it's just too short, right? <laughs> Right? We got lots of time. So, uh, you know, the whole, like, here he is taking God's word, Deuteronomy, and he's reading the book of the law, and the people, their hearts are pricked by God, and they're sucked in, and they're pulled in, and they're convicted, and they repent of their sins, and they turn back to God. He stands there, and their lives are changed because they turn back to God. In verse 32, it says, they had every... Then he had everyone in Jerusalem and Benjamin pledge themselves to it. The people of Jerusalem did this in accordance with the covenant of God, the God of their ancestors. Josiah removed all the detestable idols from the territory belonging to the Israelites. And he had all who were present in Israel serve the Lord their God. And as long as he lived, they did not fail to follow the Lord, the God of their ancestors. You see, when they turned to the word of God, a revival broke out in the land. They returned and the people's hearts were turned to God. They came back home to God. Why? Because God's word had gotten through to them. The research was done regarding our founding fathers. And they looked at 15,000 articles that were written. Articles and uh, pamphlets, booklets, monographs, different writings of our founding fathers. 15,000 of them they looked at. 
And in the course of the research, what they found out was, it was really quite astounding. They discovered that nearly 34% of all the things that they had said were direct quotations. Anytime they made a direct quotation, the quotations of other, uh, other people or things, 34% of those were biblical quotations. Of the other quotations that they made from people like Mon Mon Montesquieu, uh, Blackstone, Locke, and others, 60% of the quotes that they quoted of them were them quoting the Bible. So what they discovered in this research search was something like 94% 94, 94 of all the quotes of the founding fathers that are recorded for us were based on God's word. A nation that was founded upon the principles of God's word. That is our nation. Today, according to recent survey uh, done by Barna, 24% of the population is what, what, is what Barna would define as Bible-centered or Bible-engaged. People who actually spend more around once a week to once every couple weeks, they're spending time in God's Word, 24%. These are people who interact with God's Word frequently and use God's Word, in their words, as a guide to life. On the other end of the spectrum, 48% are disengaged or disconnected entirely from God's Word. We as a nation, a nation that was founded on the principles of God's Word, are now a predominantly Bible-disengaged culture, biblically illiterate. Two weeks ago, we talked about living God-centered lives. You saw in the life of Josiah that at 16, he turned his life back to God. And then from there, he went to the place of, so he turned to God, then he went to serving God, and then he went to cleaning, clearing his life of the idols and things in his life. But it wasn't until God confronted him with his word that his life and revival broke out to, to pursue him. You see, when we study God's word, there are some promises that we can lean on. The first promise is this. We have the promise of spiritual growth. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, it says this. Like newborn babes, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. We need to crave God's word. A friend of mine, his name's Ben. His wife just had a baby, baby's two weeks old, just had its two-week checkup, and uh, after two weeks, the baby had gained a pound. I discovered, I thought I'd do the math, if I gained a pound every two weeks, I'd weigh approximately 1,274 pounds today. It's pretty close. And why is that? Because this babe craved the pure spiritual milk of God, well, of the mother, but what we're called to is like a baby to crave that milk. When we wake up, we need to want God's word. When we lie down, we need to want God's word. When we walk along the road, we need to want God's word and interrupt what we're doing because we long for God's word. And when we pursue and when we partake of God's word, we will grow. And it begins with this attitude. The attitude of the new, newborn baby is that Milk is everything. And our attitude towards God's word is that God's word is everything. We need to grab for it, long for it, pursue it. But you also have to have an appetite for it. There's an attitude and there's an appetite. The appetite is, it's somewhat of a developed appetite. You know, it's not like you're going to love it right off. Sort of like coffee has become an acquired taste for some, many, most of you. Uh, it's an acquired taste. You maybe don't like it at the beginning, but you acquire that taste as you consume it. The Bible is very much true. The, the, that's very much true of the Bible as well. Because sometimes you jump into God's Word, and sometimes God's Word is sort of like castor oil. Like when you first partake of it, and you're like, I don't want any part of that. In time, it becomes a little bit more like shredded wheat, where it's like, I know I have to eat this, but I don't like it. But here's what God's Word tells us, is that God's Word is sweeter than honey. 
And as you spend time in God's word, the taste of God's word becomes sweeter and sweeter. And you acquire the taste and you just acquire the appetite for God's word. So you have to have the attitude and you have to have the appetite. But you also have, the, have, to, have to have the right aim. What is the aim of your Bible study? It says in 1 Peter 2, what did it say? That the purpose of reading God's word is that you may grow up in your salvation. The purpose of reading God's word is that you may grow up in your salvation. It is not that you may grow up in your knowledge. It isn't just to fill your minds with God's information. It is that you might grow in your salvation, and out of that comes a lifestyle that is lived for God. Even the devil knows God's word. Knowledge is not the end game. Growth is the end that we strive for. The second promise of studying God's word is that it is a promise of spiritual maturity. Hebrews 5 and 11 through 14, it says, We have much to say about this, but it's hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths about God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teachings about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to, to distinguish good from evil. What's the goal there? Maturity. The promise is that when we spend times in God's word, it leads, that solid food leads us to become mature and trained to distinguish good from evil. It's important as we consider that, that it isn't natural for us just to understand right from wrong, but the more time we spend in God's word, the clearer the picture is that we have of what is right and wrong. We become trained in it, we become mature in it. He's saying that if you have trained yourselves through the constant use of Scripture to distinguish good from evil, then you will become mature followers of Christ. And can I tell you, maturity in Christianity is not the same in, as maturity in age. There are some who have been Christians for 60 plus years who have not come to the place of spiritual maturity. It is not a, an indicator, age is not an indicator of maturity. It's the training. We must train ourselves in God's word. And notice, it was unique in Josiah's life that at 16, he chose to seek the God of his father David, but it wasn't until later that God's word got a hold of him and revival broke out. The third promise is this, the promise of spiritual effectiveness. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 through 17, all scripture is God-breathed. It's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. We spend time in God's word so that we might be equipped for God's work. Through God's word, we're equipped for God's work. That's what he's saying here. God's word is useful. It helps us. It rebukes us. It teaches us. It trains us in righteousness. And we can sit here and we can bemoan the loss of a Christian worldview in our culture. We can complain about the lack of biblical knowledge and the rise of biblical illiteracy. And we can fight back against the biblical illiteracy as it proliferates our world. But the question is, is what are you doing in God's word? The goal of this morning's message is that we become self-feeding followers of Christ. Are you feeding yourselves, or is this your only intake of God's word, is what you hear here on Sunday mornings? This is not the end all of your spiritual growth. This is nothing but an appetizer. And while appetizers are good, you don't make a meal of them. Or if you do, you'll soon find that it's not a very healthy diet. Let me encourage you to come here. We love that you're here on Sunday mornings, but your study and your spiritual growth needs to be spent in God's word that you might become self-feeding followers of Christ. 
learning to grow in your own ability to study and to know God's Word. So I invite you to commit yourselves to the regular study of God's Word. Not so that you can increase your knowledge, but so that you might become more mature, that you might become better servants, that you might become complete in God's Word, pursuing His Word and His righteousness. Let's pray. Lord, that we all might become self-feeding followers of Christ. That is our prayer this morning. That we would turn to your word as the guide. That it wouldn't just be so that we could be puffed up in our knowledge, but rather that we might live out your gospel. That we might be your servants, that we might be your workers, that we might be prepared for every good work that you have in store for us. So, Lord, these promises of more, we thank you for them. The promise of growth and maturity and being equipped for more. Because, Lord, we are made for more, and may we live with that in mind. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.